And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple returning brothers to the temple. Crit, the the two-headed monster that is behind Saturday Night Gaming, and the and the creators of the he of the Heavenscape multiverse, which is mu which is which is much more diverse than than certain cinematic universes that I am not allowed to say unless I feel like getting copyright struck. <laughs> <laughs> the one and only Scott Hibbard and Tony Stevens. How are you guys doing tonight, man? Oh, ready to worship. <laughs> <laughs> doing fantastic. Glad to be back. Yeah, thanks for com thanks for coming back. Oh, um. I did now. Last time I had you guys on, it was it was over the original incarnation of um, Heavenscape, where you guys were going for a more D one hundred a more D one hundred approach. Now, yes. Yeah. What now? Correct me if I'm wrong, but Heavenscape Reloaded is largely based on the Black Hack. If, is that correct? Yes, uh, you're correct on that. It's a largely uh, modified version of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what pro what prompt what prompted the change from the percentile die that you guys were using and brother of the temple Isaac Tate's swears up and down is the mo is the superior system to going <laughs> to a um, roll under D twenty system with the black hack. A lot of beta testing. <laughs> we uh we actually have a pretty good group of people that come in and play these games with us as we formulate the rules mm -hmm. and try to shift around how the mechanics work and uh i'll go ahead and give a shout out to laura uh because she uh mechanical monkey uh she can find a way to either make our system work or break our system I'd imagine yeah, that, yeah, that, that, is true. that breaking happens at the same time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, she's she's pretty good at uh, at doing that. Um, but the funny thing is, originally um, we were aiming to do something like that uh, using the black hack, um, but then we kind of abandoned that idea to go to D hundred because we thought that uh, having that more open range would allow us. Uh, you know, more advancement opportunity and a more organic leveling approach, which it did, but also brought on other issues as well. <laughs> so, which I can, I can, I can definitely, yes, uh, I can definitely see. Oh, um, now when it comes now. Of all of all the alternative approaches to go with, what what was the reason with going with the black hack? The black hack I had actually used previously in other campaigns, mm -hmm. and the simplicity of it, um, you know the uh, you know the the way we were able to use it to for narrative purposes, um, you know it, it really helped out um, as far as pushing the game forward, and of course. With Heavenscape, our main goal with this is the narrative focus of it. And, uh, I mean, essentially, if, if we have a mechanic in there that's not helping with that, uh, and it's working against it, then, uh, yeah, we definitely need to change that. All right, that, which, that makes, that makes sense. Um, now, take, now, with that, with that kind of thing in mind, um, even though now, even though you even though you guys are using the black hack, I'm get, I'm guessing that you do not consider yourself you do not consider this to be a mod of the black hack. You consider it, um, using the basis, but it's doing its own thing largely. Correct. All right. Um, now I do want to I do want to give you thanks for the um, for that little one page PDF that you sent that you sent me regarding. Um, the difference between Exordia and ba and um, Basic. Absolutely. Now, 
one of the things I want one of the things I wanted to open up asking about is the three tier system that you get that you're going with in skills. How is that how does that work in relation to the attribute role? Because obviously sure. attribute rolls with the black hack is a case of you're supposed to roll under your attribute in order to succeed. Correct, yes. And um that is still largely the case. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um uh, to give example here, you know, if you're um, you know, jumping, you know, across a ten foot gap, right? Mostly you're probably gonna use strength on that. You might be able to convince a GM to use Dex, but you know, probably gonna be strength based, mm -hmm. right? So you're still gonna roll and go under your strength. Now the skill is what comes in as far as modifying that in a, in a certain way. You've got the uh, the untrained, uh, trained, and then master. And uh, essentially, every character is considered untrained in the skill unless it's written on the character sheet and marked as trained. Okay, and uh, untrained skills are basically you would test that ability, but you would test it uh, at disadvantage. So, I mean, you jumped that ten foot gap, and you may succeed or you probably won't <laughs> at disadvantage because the odds are heavily against you, but who knows? That's what the dice are for, right? Um, but if you're trained in it, though, then you roll as normal. You just roll to D20, and you you know roll under and test as normal. But if you're a master of it, then you get to roll with advantage, which means, I mean, you have a high, high chance of succeeding, because you should, because you are a master at athletics or jumping, you know? <laughs> Now, now, um, when it now when it comes to when it comes to um spell ca when it comes to spell casting, what I do find interesting is the is that um you guys are going with the whole notion of you need you only need to spend MP when it comes to using non basic um spells or if you want or if you want to boost your spells. Would it be fair to say that with the free form approach with spell casting that it's more of a concept based design um i mean i guess you could say that yeah i mean the the, the idea behind it is that we have a, a base of this is how ba your basic spell works you know here's the here's the attributes of it like for instance uh it's a touch range you know you gotta touch the person um you know and uh with, you know it does like a, a single effect that you're looking for like maybe hey i'm trying to unlock a door you know what i mean uh, a, a certain effect you know it's had different things like that that basically makes it basic but if you want to do something more than that you know i mean yeah you can you just have to spend the extra uh, the, the mana points there and dip into your magical energy and really power it up i mean if you want to throw a fireball and light up an entire room well that's a little bit more than basic <laughs> well if you want to get out of it without getting burned uh, as i learned <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> You said you could take it. Mm -hmm. Hey, I did. I survived it. But yeah, if you want to blow up a room and take the pain for it, then uh, go for it. Uh, that's a lot of the fun of this is that even even the untrained people, uh, as far as their character sheet goes, you know, everything builds into how the player is going to play the character. But it also any little choice that they make, that character sheet is just really for as simplistic as it is. It's really in depth as far as anybody can come in, kind of get a grasp of what's going on. Uh, my wife recently just started playing with us. She's never done any kind of tabletop gaming before. And it's something that she can come in, she can enjoy, she can understand pretty quickly. Uh, now, granted, she's smart. So uh, go ahead and tell her I said that on live air. Um, <laughs> but it's still something that she can come in and understand pretty quickly versus if somebody was trying to sit there and say, okay, let's just do a quick session to 5e and everybody that's never played before can come in and understand the rules real quick. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. And when, now, when it, now I don't think we, I don't think I delved too much into this when I initially had you on, but since your since spells are going to be listed as skills in their respective schools, what would be a few examples of those um, schools within Heavenscape? Yeah, um, 
for, uh, to give examples, uh, we, we kind of went off the, the old uh, style with like D and D, like the transmutation, you know, enchantment and such like that. Uh, I mean, so like for instance, uh, one of the ones that our guys like to use is conjuration. You know, um, we had a guy who uh, he would use that, and he was a summoner, and uh, he combined it actually with the necromancy school. Uh, so what he was doing is he was actually essentially pulling uh, undead from different uh, realms and summoning them to his bidding. So he didn't have to have a body. He brought this thing from a different place altogether. <laughs> so it was pretty neat how he combined the two together. Which, that's th that's definitely something I can, some, something I can um, get behind. Um, now, when it comes to... my. Now, when it comes to milestone le milestone leveling, um, first off, the idea of milestones is some is something that I've seen a lot of games do, but each of them has their own little different definition of what they consider a milestone. And obviously, this is not something that, that can have a hard and fast rule. But what what are the general guidelines that you guys go by with what you consider a milestone? Sure. Uh, generally, when we're running campaigns, we run it in uh, two different type of milestones. Um, we have like your, your minor milestone, you know, like you complete, uh, you know, a quest line or whatnot. Uh, then you have your major one, which your major one is like, uh, you know, like the end, you're in the middle of a civil war and then it ended. You know, it's a major turning point, you know, um, and that we have two different rewards set up usually for that. So for minor ones, we usually give them out every, you know, we say three to four sessions, you know, um, just as they complete certain quest lines and move the story forward. But the major ones are like the, the, the adventures, you know, the campaigns that we run. When you get to the end of a campaign, you know, whether it be 10 weeks, 12 weeks, six weeks, you know, whatever, whoever's running the game, you know, that's when you hit that major milestone. And that's usually also at the same point to where we have a what we call a jump off point. Mm -hmm. To where characters can leave and new characters can join in, it kind of makes it that little stopping point right there. It makes it easy for transition. Yeah, and w given that, given that, I'm get, I'm guessing that um, that the mo that the milestone leveling thing is to show that there's technically a level system, but it's not the XP based approach that you might see otherwise. Correct. And it definitely gives us, because what we run is such a longer, uh, for the character development at least, we're running a longer campaign system. Uh, for instance, this past year, we've just run season one of what Heavenscape is. So a character can go through, I think I counted it up the other day, and I, I had a character go through about five different campaigns that I wasn't running personally. Uh, while Scott was running them. So you're, you're having a whole lot of campaigns that these singular characters can go through, but you want to see that there's development, there's growth, but you also don't want them to be OP and God level by the time they get through two stories. Which makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, you're mad about right, because we ran, uh, after this current campaign, this would be 12 campaigns we ran in Heavenscape. And your one character was a part of almost half of them. Mm -hmm. Right. And with now with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, I did I did want to switch to um, the concept with Heavenscape. Now, obviously the obviously the the big thing with some with something like Heavenscape is that this is a multiverse. This is not just this is not just one un one universe with one particular style of play. Um, would it be fair of me to say that that, that even with the even with the um, mechanical change that is still going to be maintained? Correct, oh, definitely, absolutely, one hundred percent. I mean, it, it, picture it like you're sitting in your your office and you've got a series of books or you've got your bookshelf. You may like to pick out one day. You might want to read some DC. You want to read a Batman book, or you want to read some Marvel. You want to read Captain America, or you want to completely go over to your Conan the Barbarian collection. 
uh, people like different genres, and that what that's what we want to do with Heaven's Gate. We want to give them that capability of entering and playing and enjoying several different genres. Now, of course, within our Heavenscape universe, our multiverse that we've built, we're building in a lot of those genres already. When people pick up this basic pack, we want them to be able to format what that means to them. Now, if they want our pre-built systems, we're going to have them ready. Uh, but if they want to build something that's unique to themselves, we're hopefully giving them some mechanics that are simple enough that they can build something that fits their taste. Mm-hmm. And when it comes now, when it comes to when it comes to to that whole to that whole fitting ta fitting taste, um, now obviously I know that the rule book is going to be in flux. But are you going to be putting in suggestions about how about how to bring in the Heavenscape rules for different um, storytelling genres? Yes, yeah, we'll have that. Um, the the basic edition. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it will be designed to not only give you the uh, the mechanics, you know, to run the game and such like that, but also gives you uh, the different content and ideas on how to run certain genres. You know, uh, that way you you have what you need, basically your toolkit uh, to go ahead and pick up and uh, create, you know, the world that you want to create. You know, uh, and that's what the basic edition is all about: is to, is to put this tool basically uh, in your hands. All right, I got, I got you now. Obviously, one obviously one of the big, one of the big things that you guys have with this whole multiverse thing is the idea of tra of transferring over transferring over characters. Um, taking that into account with both with both the original version and this current version, were there ever in, were were there ever any early instances of certain builds or the like um, being a bit more difficult to transfer over than others? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we've had a, a few of those, um, but I, I mean, I don't think that there was because of you know the the flavor of the character. You know, um, it was more of a mechanics thing. Uh, the mechanics build um, and how they they were built. It was hard to transfer them over, uh, especially when we did our crossover campaigns. Uh, you know, Tony was running a game. I was running a game, um, and then we kind of crossed over, but for a, a session. But the the problem was his uh, campaign focused more on um, artifacts, you know, and these magical items. And I didn't focus as much on that as I did on the actual character abilities. So when these two groups collided with each other, it was catastrophic. An entire town went up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's because you got people who can either. Uh, you know, we're trying to sit there and talk to each other and translate. Okay, well, what is this uh, this thing that he's got? He's got a crystal or a dagger or whatever. What does it do? And I'm telling him, okay, well, it does that in my system the way I'm working it. And he's like, oh, well, this guy over here. And of course, as soon as our players, you know, met in the middle, and there's going to be PvP. There always is. People like to hit each other. Uh, he had a character that could come in and do things I hadn't even thought of while we're sitting there doing our thing. And I've got characters that got magical items that just completely blow their characters out of the water too. So it was just really, that's like I said before, beta testing has really driven what we've come to at this point. Uh, it's been a year's worth of crossovers and plays and just going from different genres before it was like, Oh, Wow, I you know your guy met my guy and killed him with one punch. That's not uh, that doesn't work narrative wise, you know. Which that um that makes sense. Now, when it come now um when it comes to when it comes to that whole transfer thing that I mentioned before, what were so. What were some of the things that, in in the original that you got that you guys had done that you kind of wanted to avoid or just wasn't compatible with um, with the direction for this basic edition? Hmm. I think the skills was a big thing, uh, honestly, and I'll, I'll say that, and Scott can probably explain the mechanics of why, but. 
the skill tree that we were working off of on a numerical system, transferring that over into a three-tier untrained, trained mastery system, um, it was a big difference. It was a huge difference in, I, I guess, not so much how things get done, but the way the players could understand the mechanics um, and how their leveling for each skill was working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the skills, um, that was probably one of the major ones. I mean, when we had on the D hunter system, it worked the way we wanted it to, which was to, you know, have this big open range, but it also worked the way we didn't want it to, <laughs> which was, uh, like, uh, Tony, for instance, had a character who used a motorcycle, but he was terrible at it on a scale of one to a hundred. He was a 15, um, which was terrible and it showed during gameplay um, but <laughs> it it didn't really fit though his character as far as uh you know the, the narrative went the mechanics kind of worked against that um and so you know that's the problem that we had was that we brought over this character who should be pretty decent at doing what he does but for some reason he really sucked at this one thing <laughs> you know yeah because that was his dump skill, pretty much. So that's kind of where we had mechanics and narrative collide. But uh, doing this skill system differently kind of allows us to uh, kind of compensate for that, you know. I mean, you might have a, a couple bad rolls here and there, but um, for the most part, I mean, if he's skilled with a motorcycle, it'll show. Yeah, yeah. every roll I had with that motorcycle was bad. Long story short, I wrecked the motorcycle, and my character walks now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope to God you got insurance. Uh, he, he, yeah, Austin. <laughs> <laughs> they, co they cover mystical motorcycles now. <laughs> Look, stranger things have happened in the, in that particular line of work. Yes. Now, um. Obviously, obviously, a lot, a lot of OSR games and a lot of, and the and the like tend to you tend to utilize some form of class or archetype system. Was there the temptation to do that with Heavenscape Basic and how and um are you are you eschewing that in order to maintain a maintain a free form approach? It, yeah, originally, um, when we were building the system out, we did use the typical archetypes and such. Um, we did that. Um, but we found that by doing that, we just really... It took us down the direction we didn't really want to go with it, you know, mm -hmm. um, as far as restricting the characters. Because, you know, this class or this race or whatever gives these bonuses. And, you know, it's like, well, I mean, that's great mechanic-wise. And it's really easy to, you know, build something like that. You know, it's harder to build it more freeform because it's less structure, you know. Yeah. Um, but it didn't really fit what we we're wanting. So that's why we switched it over to the the, the origin system, mm -hmm. you know, which is basically the background, you know. So you can have an orc and a human have the same origin, you know, and then they'll have the, the same bonuses or whatnot. Um, but you're not restricted to like, oh, my intelligence is lower because I chose this, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. For the rest of time, yeah. Yeah, you don't have that. Yeah. And when it I know I asked this last time, but I do think I do think it's it's appropriate to ask once again. How are how are you at how are you guys when it comes to handling the issue of choice paralysis? Because whenever you do free form of on one hand, you have the option of getting people a lot of choices in what they can do. On the other hand, people have a lot of choices in what they can do. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, it does come up in character creation, but I have played enough of these games to where I have been able to help people. <laughs> so, basically, if I, if I see a player struggling at character creation, you know, then I just start asking them some uh, qualifying questions. You know, it's like, all right, well... um what do you have in mind? You know, like if you get into combat, what are you going to do? Are you going to throw a spell? Or are you going to uh, hit him with a sword, you know, or, or what are you going to do? You know, and they're like, oh, well, I want to hit him from ranged. Okay, well, 
We can count swords out. We can count axes out, <laughs> you know? So let's, let's focus on bows and magic, you know? Do you really want to worry about the magic system, you know? No, I don't want to keep it. That's too complicated. All right, well, bows it is, <laughs> you know? And basically just work with, the, uh, with them and help them, even though they have these choices, you know, help show them what their options are in the system, basically. It's like, if this is the effect you're wanting to go for, then, hey, maybe look at these exploits or maybe look at this origin, you know? Definitely, because despite the rare gem that you're going to find, most players gravitate towards uh, pretty focused. They're pretty stuck on a certain character. They're, it's an archetype in their head of what it is they're seeing themselves to become. And they pretty much repeat, and uh, they rinse and repeat that. They just want to add different flavors or say, hey, I wish I had done this a little bit differently the next time. Um you know, like my wife points out to me, I like to play gritty old soldier characters. Uh, and I'm always like, no, I don't. I'm really diverse in my gritty old soldier characters. Uh, so it is true. It is to say, it's something that we all kind of do. You may want to be a magician one time, uh, but then you end up turning it into magic bullets that you're shooting out of guns because you're a gritty old soldier. So... It just, you, you kind of get to know your players, and that, that's where a GM really isn't replaceable at any point in time. If you have a good GM, that's really what's going to make things work. Yeah. And with, the, with that kind of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind, um, even, though, even though you guys are trying to go more freeform, has there been thought of provide of providing a set of sample archetypes that somebody can um, build off of when they're first trying things out? Yes, um, actually, uh, the plan is to actually uh, introduce some of our characters from the podcasts mm -hmm. um, as a written character, so you can actually see what their uh, their stats will look like. You know, yeah, I've listened to the podcast, I've heard what their exploits on what they've done, but now I can see them on paper and see what that looks like in the system. All right, that makes sense. That makes sense. Now, when it now when it comes to when it comes when it comes now when it comes to the uh, size of the book, how a lot of black hack books are pretty light. How big are you shooting for with th with um this? As far yeah, as page we, count, yeah, page count um. I mean, really, we're shooting for the basic edition. N nothing else added in there. You know, no, no extra stretch goals, nothing like that. We're shooting for a roughly 90 pages, but it's not your 8.5 by 11. <laughs> so it's, the, you know, the 5.5 the style. So mm -hmm. it's like the smaller pamphlet book, uh, yeah. but about 90 yeah. pages of that. So it's kind of like, you know, more like a pocket book, but it have roughly about 90 pages what we're looking at. Uh, that's what we're shooting for. Yeah. Now... I know it was mentioned. I know it was mentioned that magic that um, expanded magic items would be a stretch goal. But when it comes to magic items as a whole, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to pick your brain a little bit. First, what's your philosophy when it comes to magic items and how to avoid the Monty Hall problem? Well, man, that's a good question. There we. With our magic items, for the most part, we try to keep it open, kind of like the rest of the system is. You know, um, like uh, we have certain qualities. You know, we have like the, the Mastercraft, we have the epic items, legendary items. And then we have little guidelines as far as how many abilities to stack on each of them, you know. Um, but as far as what those each of those abilities do, uh, we really just kind of leave it up to uh, the players and the GM to get creative with it, you know. Um, I mean, Tony can probably give you some examples here since he focused heavily on artifacts um, and some really fun ones. He can probably give you some examples of how he did his. Oh, yeah. So, well, okay. So, I mean, a majority of the game that I ran was based in, and it's, it's not uh, kind of given in way too much to say that it was based heavily in Norse mythology, a uh, form of it that I changed, but it was Norse mythology. And we all know in Norse mythology what's some of the most popular stuff. Thor's got his hammer. It comes back to him. It channels lightning, whatever. Yeah. Uh, Odin's got his spear. 
And so everything worked even in that mythos. If you go back and read any kind of like the Nordic poetry and uh, stuff of that nature, everything had a reason. Everything had a something that made it special. So, for instance, Thor's hammer came back to him. Well, that's got to be something that my character has involved in this this magic ivor or this magic weapon. What is it that they're looking for? Now, when I ran that Viking style campaign, uh, a lot of them, they kind of honed in on just that one thing. I, I want to throw this axe and I want it to come back to me. Well, that's kind of an easy thing to do. No big whoop, throw the axe, it comes back to you. Uh, I'll give you that. Now, later on, I had them discover throughout the campaign uh, similar magical items, but I flavored them up for them to try and help them along the path of things can do more than just be a boomerang. Um, so, for instance, a guy finds magical armor. Well, I'm going to try and give him some sort of an advantage or a bonus within that armor. Uh, either he's going to take less damage in some way we increases his health in some way. Uh, one fella, I actually liked his a lot. He had this thing called Soul Dagger, so that if he stabbed an entity, he could actually drain the health points from that entity into the dagger. Now, it was held in the dagger, so he actually had a counter to use on that dagger, and the reason why he did this was because his magic system actually utilized health points to burn them to initiate the spells. So instead of pulling off of his own health, he had these things basically stored within an object, and he could use those to burn for his own magical spells. So it's just, for me, it's just about getting creative. It's about getting inventive. As we build these expansion packs for Heaven's Gate down the road, we will have a ton of of things that we've pre-built for you that we'll give to you that will say, Hey, we made it, you use it, go, go break something with it. Um, but at <laughs> the same time, you know, ingenuity is king. So if you, if you're, if you're a player and you're building off this basic system, I would totally, uh, you know, motivate people and inspire them to try and build something that's unique to them. Uh, that can work within the rule structures, uh, you know, and with ours being such a free form sandbox, I think that there's a good chance that people can build something that they thought of that maybe they couldn't get to blend with other systems before. Mm -hmm. Now within the, with, within, the, within that, um, you guys talk about it being a living concept and, I know that you guys have the have the podcast, but do you have do you have plans on put on putting some sort of collected material on the on um on a on a site or or the like, whether it be world whether it be um well, you already have a world anvil page, but um do you have but do you have plans on expand on expanding that further to get to again to give more advice on doing cro doing crossovers and the like. I think that what you said before it's a living concept so mm -hmm. yes the answer is completely and a definite yes uh within the description of heavenscape it's a multiverse and yeah. to me and i think to scott as well that means something more than just within this story there's a multiverse that exists this is a multiverse of genres that we're going to try to touch on so we have the podcast we have the wiki page we have the uh world anvil site that we're using uh, we have the Facebook that we're reaching out to people with. Also, um, working on translating a lot of our gameplays into book narratives now. Um, I've already got one typed up completely that's in the editing process, working on the next one. Uh, so we're going to try and reach out to as many genres as possible so that our information is out there. And when it comes to things as far as helping people to create their own version of things uh that's something that i think that scott and i both believe in heavily is that people's brains are the best resource all the people who are listening to us the people who are going to eventually be playing our game um using our system to help them play their own game that is what it's all about that is where the creativity is key and anything that we can do to try and help that along is something that as it comes up we do. We do everything we can. Like you said earlier, 
you ask Scott uh, just a small question, and what does he have ready for you within within a heartbeat? He's got a PDF ready. He is constantly working on improving this monster so that it is ready for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, and um, like what Tony said there, I mean, we, you know, the, the thing is we are consumers too. Um, and so we understand that everybody consumes uh, media differently, you know, um, especially in our group. I mean, there's people in our group that don't even listen to any of our podcast, <laughs> you know, whether they're on it or not, they just don't. But they'll sit there and they'll read everything that we write about on uh, World Amp, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, and that it, it's just it's great. I mean, it gives us different avenues to pursue. Uh, so we do have the podcast, but we also have the World Anvil. And like Tony said, we're working on the novels, um, you know, because we want to be able to put uh, Heavenscape out there in just different formats for anybody to pick up and gain inspiration from, whether it's from listening to it or picking up a book and reading it. Now, within within that within all within all of that, um, now when it comes to creatures. Obviously, obviously, the concept of challenge rating is something is something that is going to be adjacent to this to this sort of thing. But given how given how freeform char- characterization can be alone, do you have plans on put on putting some sort of guide for for um custom cre- for custom creatures? Yes. Uh, yeah. There there'll be a guide in there as far as running the the different uh you know what we call threat levels of yeah. creatures you know because obviously a large red dragon is different than a goblin <laughs> you know <laughs> so yeah th- there'll be different things in there as well for that as far as uh, tips for creating your own um and also some examples too uh, from our own games that we run uh, our own creations um because man it, we've gotten pretty creative with some of these <laughs> yeah yeah and the, when it comes to the main thing, the main thing, and I'm glad that you guys mentioned a threat level, because something that I could easily see see being a concern is making sure that encounters that are placed don't intentionally overwhelm um, players. I'm not saying I'm not saying follow ch- follow threat levels to the to the absolute um, absolute maximum, but. You don't you don't want to th- you don't want to throw in a um, custom creature that ends up being a little more powerful than you had planned. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Because uh, I think anybody's ran a game has done that before. <laughs> you know. <Yeah. laughs> oh. TPK. Okay. Whoops. That was. Or you, you either you either build out a monster that completely destroys them or you build out a threat that you think is going to keep them satisfied for the night and they kill it within a few seconds and you didn't quite think it through far enough. And, you know, I think that what we've come to uh, a lot of the times, especially within the new threat system that we've built out, is that not only can a singular entity, a singular monster, but uh, especially when you have a horde, you know, a large um, because it's easy to keep track of how this one humongous beast is doing damage to your party and how much damage they're doing to it and kind of keep track of how that fight's going and then call it to a natural close when it makes sense. But the bigger problem is when you have a huge threat for these people and you're, you're trying to keep track of a hundred zombies or, or whatever you want to say, just a big group of things that's attacking them it's like, oh, man, do I have to keep track of the health points of each and every single one of these little things and how much damage three of them is going to do versus one of them? And, uh, you know, Scott is uh, he's an ingenious inventor, man. He he came up with a good way of solving that issue uh, so that you can tell a narrative where maybe I want my people to be overrun by an army in that one point of the story because that's going to lead to the next part of the narrative. Uh, where they're tra- they're trapped, they're captured in a prison or something mm-hmm. of that nature, um, and they're like, "Wait, hold on! I thought I was doing really good at killing a uh, hundred army people, and I'm one dude." You know, it's sometimes it just works better to have a good mechanic in place so you don't have to sit there and argue uh, what made more sense. And 
logic isn't always king when it comes to how players want their their character to work because uh, a lot of people want the superman effect on their character they want to write in that that character gets to win no matter what mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes you don't always want them to win and they don't even realize it as they're playing a campaign that they don't necessarily want their character to win every time because it'll get boring um so Definitely the way that Scott's rebuilt the threat system to additionally work into group settings uh, where you have a large army that's that's at play. As it's working right now, I think it works so much better than anything that we've been using previously. Which that that's definitely some that's definitely something I can get behind. Um when you mentioned now, given that you mentioned the whole threat, the whole threat level, walk me through what would be some examples of various um, threat levels, just so I can see what the baselines would be. Yeah, sure. Um, here, I'll tell you what. I'll go ahead and tell you what I got. Yeah, we have roughly about six different uh, threat levels, is what we uh, kind of rested with. We've had more and less in the past, and we've just kind of, you know, settled on six because it just seems to work for what we were doing. Because we didn't want too many threat levels because then you're trying to figure out, well, which one is this? Where does this fall in? <laughs> you know? Um, and we didn't want too little because it's like, well, what if this guy doesn't fit here or there? You know? So we needed just the right amount. So what we've done is we have about six different uh, threat levels, and um, I'll go through them real quick. So we start off at average threat. So uh, an example of that would be, you know, uh, say a goblin, you know, mm -hmm. just, just a little goblin. It's a little average threat, you know. Um, you know, he could do something to you. Then again, at the same time, you could probably whack him a couple of times and he's gone, right? Um, but then we have other one. We got the moderate threats. We also have difficult threats. And this is where you start getting your, like, goblin shamans or clan leaders, you know. And then you have them mixed in there, too. You know, because you have your regular goblins as average and you've got your, uh, you know, clan leaders as difficult. Mm -hmm. But then we start going up even further. Um, and this is when we start getting to the really interesting encounters. Right. So we start having uh, strenuous is one of the threat levels. So this one is going to run you through much harder than any other ones will. <laughs> you know, so if you want to think about that one as, you know, let's say the Hydra, you know, that's probably a good example. You know, that, that, that's definitely going to be quite a, uh, a challenge there, taking it on, you know, especially much more than a, a goblin, you know, clan leader, you know. Uh, and, of course, above that, we got the uh, Herculean. So an example of that one, would I, the dragon I used earlier, a dragon could be that type of a, a threat, you know, uh, a major large creature uh, or even not even a large creature. Um, I mean, it could be a small one, you know. I mean, some small creatures can be big threats. And that's the other thing, too, is that with these challenges, you're not limited. It's not by size, you know. That's just typically how we scale things in our minds, you know. The, the bigger the threat, the larger the creature. But sometimes it's the small ones that are more threatening. Um, and then, of course, our, our final one is what we call the nemesis. And, and these are like the ones to where it's you have a very slim chance of of beating them i mean if you want to think of it like uh for instance uh they're like deities you know they would be in this this range um you could even have even demigods be like that as well i mean these are extremely top of the line if you get hit by them it's going to hurt a lot if you do manage to hit them it's not going to do a lot <laughs> yeah. and the beauty of this though and this is this is how we built this the beauty of it isn't not necessarily you know, oh, this Hydra is always going to be this challenge rating. The way we built it is that we built it based upon the party, okay? So let's say, for instance, uh, you know, you had the Goblin Clan Leader start off as difficult threat rating, right? But let's say through investigation, maybe through some ingenuity of the players, you guys have found a way to make that Goblin you know, clan leader, less threatening, okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe you found a way to sneak in there and get to jump on him, right? Or found some way to sabotage something within, you know, uh, their uh, cave, right? In that case, 
what you could do as a GM is you could drop that difficulty down. So due to players' ingenuity, you could just drop them down from being a difficult down to a moderate. Okay, so you, you can kind of reward players uh, for using ingenuity instead of just jumping in there and just rushing and killing everything just straight off the bat. <laughs> you know? Definitely. Because that's one thing I always, in, in every game that I run, I like to uh, commit to rewarding people on teamwork. Because uh, the majority of the time, you'll get one, call them XP hogs or power hungry players. You got one guy that just wants to get everything for himself, kill everybody, or basically challenge everything on his own. I like to really challenge that kind of motif and get people to not only work it so that they're understanding their character, their traits, their mechanics better, um, but that they're also understanding the rest of the party. Because if, as we mentioned to you the last time, we run games with up to, uh, I mean, right now we've got a game going with 10, 10 players in it. So when you have a lot of people going, you want a lot of people to feel good when they leave that night. Everybody's coming to the party so that they can feel some sort of reward. So at the end of the day, the best way to do that in, in a single session is to get everybody to work together. I know how my the person to my right or my left works in tandem with how I work. You know, I've got a, a magician and she's sitting there. She's maybe she's my healer. You know, she's my support character. And I've also got a tank that likes to go and bash things right off the bat. I'm more tactical. Uh, so in what way can we work together to take down this threat? And that, in my mind, can take something that's an advanced threat, a, a larger threat, and move it down a little bit because you're working as a unit. You're, you're working to take it down. That's ingenuity, and that should always be uh, rewarded, in my opinion. Now, you might have a GM that wants to like make people turn on each other. That could be the key of whatever campaign he's running. And definitely go for that as well. It's whatever style you've agreed with your players moving into something. But they kind of want to, you know what they want to get out of that. You know, you don't send a guy to a donut shop and offer him a piece of pizza. Uh, you you want to know what they're going for and you want to reward that in some way. Mm -hmm. although, although sending somebody to, to make a pizza-shaped donut doesn't sound like a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm hungry now. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It sounds like the. It sounds like the kind of thing I would do. Especially since I love sharing images of cursed food. <laughs> <laughs> um. And take taking that into account when you mentioned the idea of of hordes, um. Mm -hmm. There are some games that will have some sort of special rule for horde variants of monsters or swarm variants or what have you. Um, is that something that you had considered when it came to encounter design? Uh, yes, actually. Um, so, you know, taking back to the example of the goblins, for instance, you know, they, they function on their own with their own special, uh, you know, tactics or whatnot, you know. Um, but at the same time, if they work together... Um, then what you can call, if you want to call it a, a horde mechanic, you know, um, by working together, they unlock this other potential they didn't have by themselves, you know. So when they get together and they form a horde, they have access to uh, certain abilities they didn't have access to before because there's more of them, you know, and that's kind of like the concept with it. And plus, the with the horde system, the way it's set up is the larger the horde, the more of a challenge it is. And that's where that challenge rating kind of comes in, you know, that, that threat level. Um, that's where that comes in. And you could actually, as you dismantle the horde, you basically can reduce the uh, the amount of threat that it remains. Because, uh, I mean, you know, <laughs> the less goblins you got running around, the less of a threat, right? Yeah. And what is it, can, is it, is it one of those instances where... So where somebody would be, where somebody would be able to um, add additional effects onto onto the monster sheet if there's more of them in the encounter, or is it or is it a um, different approach? No, absolutely. Well, I mean, you can. I mean, 
Oh, well, actually, a good example is uh, like with Tony. Um, he, we have this uh, this beings called uh, the Okai, right? Um, mm-hmm. And the way Tony used it um, in his campaign that he's running the same time as me was different than the way I used it, <laughs> but it's still the same being. Definitely, and and with variations too. Uh, I was running one campaign where they were going up a, a single a singular threat as far as they're at war with this one race class. Uh, and so, but within that race class, you had some of them were built to be tanks. They were huge. They were brutes. There were other ones that had a long range effect. I call them spitters, uh, but they had like an acidic spit kind of thing going on. So they were ranged attacks. And then you also had flyers, ones that had wings and whatnot. And so within that, as, as I had a group of, I think at the time it was uh, four tactical players. They're supposed to be tactical soldiers of some sort. Uh, and they were fighting off against these things. Well, there's only four of them, first of all. So if you're fighting a whole horde, things aren't looking good for you to begin with. Somebody should have dropped the gun and said, game over, man, just like Bill Hudson. Um, but within that, they also had those different class variations. So that, in my mind, is like having a giant creature that can do all sorts of things at different times. Uh, but it's just this spread out army that they're facing. And that was actually a good example of one time that I basically beat them um, so that they would have to move forward into a different part of the narrative and think about how they were attacking the problem differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and actually in that example, uh, those creatures he used, I used in a campaign later on um, because long story short, they got sent to a different realm by accident. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so I used that, um, but then the way I used them, like these flyers, I used them as kind of uh, similar to like the flying monkeys from Wizard of Oz. (laughs) Okay. So these things came in, swarmed the players, and actually started picking up some of the player characters and taking them into the air, (laughs) you know? And that's just how I kind of, I ran with them and I built them. I I used them, you know? Uh, So yeah, I mean, there are different variations. I mean, we have... You know, I guess you could say suggested, you know, uh, with with the uh, creatures. But again, by all means, be as creative as you want to. Mm -hmm. And when now when it comes to when it comes when it comes to that that um, creativity, um, I'm curious, I'm curious what some of the crazier builds that you've seen during uh, playtesting have been. <laughs> I'll let John, Tony John the Red. Hands. John the Red. <laughs> there was a there was a character that uh, I have a great great guy. He comes and plays all the time, uh, but he built this character for the Viking campaign that was called John the Red, and he had. I I'll put it this way: I don't think he really knew what he wanted the character to be, uh, but by the end of the campaign. He was the MacGuffin. He was probably one of the most powerful characters. He had a, uh, we all know about the bag of holding. Well, he had a cloak with all these pockets in it. And he was basically, uh, at the time, he was making a joke to an old comic book creator that liked to put pouches on everything, and I'll leave him unnamed, but he loved pouches. So he put all these pouches on this cape that he was wearing. Well, it ended up he could use these to reach in to, uh, uh, a void space to basically pull out whatever he wanted that he could use. It all depended on his roles. Um, but I mean, just one of the craziest characters I've ever seen with some of the stuff he pulled off. And, and that's just because as a player, that fella is, he's always thinking he's always creative and he doesn't like to stay in any kind of a box. He hates being told what to do. So you know, if you let him sit there and go on his own path, you, you end up with one of the most creative things uh, you've ever seen in your life. Um, so, yeah, that character, I mean, he could throw his sword. And like I said before, well, what's one thing everybody wants him to do? They wanted to come back to them. Well, he used this in a whole different way. He would throw it and then jump on it and ride it places. So he was using it as a vehicle transport. It's like, well, 
I didn't see that coming, but I kind of have to let it go because he rolled really well and it, it worked. Uh, so go for it. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, that that character was one of the craziest. And of course, at the end of that campaign, I had built out uh, something built to be a chaos god. So that in and of itself, just in how they had to get creative in killing this thing, uh, it just listen to the podcast sometime. You'd, you'd be amazed at some of the things uh, <laughs> our players come up with. I mean, there's a lot of joking. There's a lot of fun. But there's a lot of great creativity in how they solve problems. And I definitely don't get go in uh, to GMing trying to make the problems easy to solve. Yeah, man. That, I remember that character. And it was so hilarious because... I mean, when we did a crossover, everybody's like, wait, what was he doing? What is he reaching to his pocket for? <laughs> you know, <laughs> meanwhile, it, Tony's entire group is like hitting the floor. Like, oh, no, everybody hit the ground. We don't know he's going to pull out. Our group's like, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. But uh, in, in my campaign, I ran one of the craziest concepts I had. And he was he was the, the, the comedic relief of the group. So. We had a resident necromancer, and so we had another player who had an idea. He's like, I got an idea. He goes, I want to play a necromancer. I'm like, <laughs> what? He goes, yeah. I'm like, all right. So I was like, explain to me again. <laughs> and so he did. I'm like, well, this is going to be interesting. This character had this whole concept of he wanted to follow the other player who was a necromancer. He was so enamored with him. However... What he discovered and found was that he couldn't raise bodies or summon undead, but he could summon cats. So it's a Nico answer. <laughs> so what he did is he picked up conjuration and he would summon cats of various types. At one point, he summoned a uh, little hell kitty, which was a kitten, and that they used as a torch to walk down, um, you know, a, a dungeon path to light the way. <laughs> Meanwhile, in other campaigns, you might see a cat that just randomly disappears. <laughs> yes, because he was drawing the cats from somewhere, and then they would also return, sometimes alive, sometimes dead. Um, but, <laughs> you know, they would return regardless. <laughs> and uh, at one point in the campaign, he actually summoned a battle cat. So I was like, all right, dude, this is hilarious, and this is great. You know, because the best part was, even though he could summon these things, it did not give him automatic control over them. So he still had to use his uh, animal handling skills to convince them to follow his commands. <laughs> Which um, I could see, I could see that I could see that kind of thing being put, being um, being being. Being made for for some new av- for some new avenues, especially a means of making sure that somebody isn't relying on just their spell casting. <laughs> also, my sympathies for trying to er- for trying to herd cats. <laughs> <laughs> More often than not, the rules went against them, and it was hilarious. But uh, it made some great gameplay, though. What do you mean? I'm in a room full of rocking chairs. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, I'm not letting you just I'm not letting you just drop that and, th- and then forget about it. Explain. Uh let's just say Dave didn't his, the character's name was Dave. Uh it just it really did not always go his way. He got attacked by one of them as soon as they came out. Is that right, Scott? Yeah, it was the battle cat when it came out because uh he summoned it and then uh he couldn't command it. And he uh, like critically failed on the command, <laughs> so he did the opposite. So he ended up having to like battle his own kitty. Meanwhile, everybody else in the party is actually fighting the boss. <laughs> he's he's one of our mechanic monkeys too. Actually, uh, really good at, at testing systems and understanding mechanics, and uh, just a great guy all the way around. But some of the stuff he comes up with for player characters is it'll blow your mind. It'll just always blow your mind. Uh, 
just a very inventive kid. Although it's one of those things where the old mantra continues to apply. The dice gods show no mercy. Amen. <laughs> Amen, exactly. <laughs> but I find a lot of times with these guys, it, you know, they, they create something uh, to be a joke, and it ends up just being a fan favorite. I think that somebody along the way had to have felt that way about a certain funny superhero in a red suit. Uh, you know, it's it was created as a joke. It was to make fun of something, but then along the way, people love it, and it's just... You got to keep flavoring that sort of stuff in there. It can't always be just a guy who wants to show up. I'm here to play Conan the Barbarian. I just want to be the big tough guy that wins the day and does it with uh, a noble cause. Sometimes you got to have a crazy guy trying to herd cat. Yeah, I can't. I given some given the um, up button story that I told you guys about last time. I can't really pass judgment. <laughs> um, look, when you look when you end up making a character whose specialty is making traps, gravity becomes a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> but now you guys have now. First off, congrats on managing to get past your um, goal of two fifty. Um, I know you guys have six days to go at the time at the time of this recording, but once everything's settled and um, Kickstarter has um, gone through all the shenanigans, what would you what would you say is the release window you're shooting for? I know it says March 2021 on the estimated delivery on the page, but what are you aiming for as far as a broad um, net? Uh, well, when we put that uh, that date in there, we basically oh, way we just overestimated is what we did, mm -hmm. you know, because we've been working on this and we were we're actually still working on this and everything put together. Um, so really, all we're needing um, to kind of start wrapping things up um, is to finish up this uh, you know play testing we're doing and then go ahead and start doing uh, the rest of it, you know, like the artwork and the editing and everything. Um, so, I mean, it's not like we're starting from scratch and just, uh, you know, all right, we're going to build this going to be the next year guys, you know, now we've been working this thing, <laughs> you know, so we really want to get out there as soon as possible. Um, uh, that, that's, that's really what we want to do, you know? Um, but you know, we just kind of estimated things out and just said, all right, well, you know, we'll put some time in there and just plan for things unexpected that we can't see right now. And I will just shoot for this, but we really want to get out there as soon as we can. I mean, if we could get it out there at the beginning of the year, daggone it, we're going to do that, you know, if we can do that. <laughs> so Definitely. But we do we do like to put that buffer in there because you never know if one year a, a plague takes over the world and stops shipping corporations and makes everybody stay at home. You just never know what's going to happen. But uh, between all the work that we've done already and the committed uh, – workmanship that we have within our group i see that we're going to probably overshoot that goal but we like to to promise what we can and then uh surprise people at the end of the day mm -hmm. now i'll definitely be looking looking forward to it especially since i'm fair i'm fairly certain there will be ways to surprise even me <laughs> but with that in mind I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time to come up to the temple a se a second time around and enjoy the drinks and the insanity that comes along. Oh, definitely. There's nothing I enjoy more than drinking in the temple. <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course, anytime you guys see fit to return, the door is always open. Thank you so much. That's uh, That's a huge huge thing to us we highly appreciate you and your time that you've given us mm -hmm. and helping us to get this idea out to the world yeah absolutely we enjoy it very much mm -hmm. it's always a pleasure coming and visit yep um and of course a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness and there'll be plenty more where that came from as there always is here on the open bar of the internet but until then 
on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!